My parents left on one ship from, from Vienna to Schönborn with about six or 700 people. Uh, we boarded another ship in Bratislava. Uh, well, there were about a thousand people on that ship, some people from our camp and from other, from other people who came from various other places from Central Europe. And two, altogether about four ships sailed down the Danube. And on all those four ships were about 3,400 people. 3,400 people, people were distributed on four ships. I was on one ship and my parents were on another. Now who do these ships belong to? They belong to the German government, to the what is called the Donaudampfschifffahrtsgesellschaft, which is a, a steamship company. I think it's state-owned, but I can't tell you. It's a big uh, the Danube steamship company. That was the name of the company that owned these. These were paddle wheelers, big paddle wheelers. It was very crowded, let me tell you. A, star, a thousand people on a ship like this, it was very crowded, but still we were glad to go. You know, it was very crowded, but it was, food was not bad, and we were traveling down the Danube through, through Hungary, first to Slovakia, then through Hungary, through Budapest. We saw Budapest, we traveled right through Budapest, down the Danube through Yugoslavia, then through uh, Romania, to Bulgar Bulgaria and I think Romania, if I remember rightly. Did you know your parents were on one of the ships? Yes, my parents had told, had, had got a letter from my parents that uh, they were on, they decided to go on, be on that ship. And as a matter of fact, at one place, I think it was in Bulgaria, the ships were lying one next to the other, I jumped across and I visited my parents on the other ship. It was very, uh, somewhere in Bulgaria or in Romania, you know, it was possible the ships were lying one against the other. So I visited my parents the first time after nine months. So we said hello. And then we continued and uh, eventually we, we uh, arrived in Romania at the Danube estuary at a place called Tulcea. It's a Danube. And, and in Tulcea there were three Greek ships anchored in the Danube. Three Greek ships were there and they were the ones supposed to take us to Palestine. We stayed a few more days on these Danube ships, and then we were transferred to those high, so-called high sea ships. Now there were three ships there. One was the Atlantic of about 1,400 tons. The other one was the Pacific and the Milos. So on the Atlantic were about uh, 1,800, and the rest were on the uh, on the two other. I think it was 1,000 and 800 on the other one. I was on the Pacific. And my parents were, since they were, came from another ship, were on the Atlantic. So we were on two different ships. But eventually, we were stayed in, in, in Romania in this port for about two weeks because the ships were not ready. They hadn't, the fuel was missing, or I don't know. Anyway, the ships were standing there. And during the time, uh, my parents had apparently approached someone, and it was arranged for me to be exchanged against somebody else. So anyway, I joined my parents on the Atlantic. A boat came, and this was done, of course, with the permission of the Romanian authorities. I joined my parents on the Atlantic, and shortly thereafter, the Pacific and the Milos took off, and the Atlantic was left behind because I think there were some engine, engine problems. But these were solved, and we left. The Atlantic was under the Panama flag. We left, we left Tulcea, um, I think, on September the 14th, I think. And we arrived in Istanbul after very fast. Istanbul, of course, we were never allowed to land anywhere because it was all illegal. Everybody knew it was illegal. Our ship was flying the Panama flag, and, uh, and there were the, the vast crowds of people on that ship. Everybody knew what this was. So the Turkish authorities, of course, did not allow us to land, or we didn't want to land there anyway. But they supplied us with bread and water, and we continued again. We continued again through the Greek islands. We stopped at various small islands, I think at Chios, or Eos, and Mytilene, which is, I think, used to be called Lesbos. And at each place, I must say, at every little island, the Greeks were poor people. They gave us always bread and water, free. They didn't, they didn't pay, we didn't, we didn't have to pay for that. Bread and water was delivered a boat came out, usually used a boat came out, a big boat. It was full of these, uh, these long loaves, these Greek loaves, and the water boat came out, and they pumped the water into the containers, and uh, they supplied us with bread. We stopped first at, I think, uh, Mytilene, which used to be called, I think, at one time, Lesbos. 
and at Chios and at Eos at various other small Greek islands. And wherever we stop, we got from the Greek port authorities bread and water. They, of course, knew who we were. We were because this was not the first transport I had gone through. They knew who we were, and they were kind enough to supply us for free, I think, with bread and water. So the Greeks, I must say, the Greeks I have high regard for Greek, for the Greek, Greeks since then. They supplied us with, with uh, food for free. Also, I remember one, one incident at one of those islands. We had arrived there, and we got the bread and the water, and then we continued on our way, and as we were sailing out, um, there was this Greek, um, there was this Greek uh, priest standing there on, a, on, on the edge of the port. I knew it was a, gr a Greek priest because they had a very spe specific dress. And he stood there, and <laughs> Anyway, he raised his hands and he, he kind of he kind of blessed the ship. So um, he. Eventually, after about a few days, we arrived in Crete, a place called Heraklion. It's a big, big port. And there, our coal ran out. We didn't have any more coal. The ship was running on coal, by the way, not oil. It was a coal, an old coal, coal-burning ship. Uh, the crew and the captain were all Greek. Right? The captain was a Greek and the crew were Greek. So we ran out of coal and uh, got stalled there in the port. Uh, right at this time, the war broke out between Greece and Italy. In other words, Italy declared war on Greece, and there were daily air raid alarms. There were no air raids, but there were air raid alarms. And, uh, and it, it, uh, it became very dangerous. You know, there were, there were Italian planes were, were flying overhead. They didn't drop any bombs, but it, it looked as if it were it would get more dangerous. And the Greeks, of course, didn't know what to do with us. They did, the Greeks was a small country fighting against a big power. They wanted to get rid of us. Uh, eventually, eventually, I don't know about the background of this, eventually after about staying for two weeks, in, in two weeks, I think, in, in Crete, we got coal. How we got it, I, I don't know, but I think I heard that some Jewish big businessman in, in Athens uh, had some influence with the Greek government, and he was. That's how we got the call. But uh, that is, that I'm not sure. We left. We left Crete, and our ship was steaming east, in the direction of the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, what happened after about a day or so, for some unexplained reason, which is not even today, not that has been found out, we ran out of coal again. This time we ran out of coal again. And the, the captain said he cannot continue because he hasn't got enough coal. He can't reach the eastern Mediterranean. There was just a little bit coal left. And he said he would like to return to Greece. Now, we figured that he's in a maneuver of the captain. He's a, he's a crook. And we wanted to continue further east. So what happened was we arrested the captain. Our leadership took the captain, arrested him in his cabin, and there he was kept under guard. Under guard. And uh, our, we had a, amongst the Czech group, there was one who was a, a, a Air Force pilot, and a Czech Air Force pilot. He took over the, the ship, 
together with the first officer who decided, the first officer was a Greek, who decided to cooperate with us. So the, the Czech Air Force pilot with the Greek first officer uh, took over the ship and, co and, and the crew continued uh, the, the crew continued to work, you know, the, the people, the stokers and so forth. But there was not much to stoke because the fact is that after about a day or so we really ran out of coal and the sea ship came to a stop in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> so what we decided to do then was we decided to break up the whole ship, whatever there was made out of wood, and chop it up and f put it into the furnace and try to continue in this fashion. We ripped up the deck. The deck was that thick and was uh, steel underneath. That was ripped up. The masts were cut up. All the interior of the ship was all demolished. There were cabins and uh, the partitions, everything, everything made out of wood was ripped up and cut up and there was a long chain, like a human chain, that went into the engine room and these big pieces of wood went down into the engine room and eventually into the furnace. Now in this way, we continued for another day or so, or two days. Uh, during that time, it was, you know, the, there was no land in sight at all. We knew we were going east, and that's all we knew. That was the important thing. We were going east in the direction of the eastern Mediterranean, right? Now, it, suddenly, a, two destroyers appeared, two, two warships. They appeared on the horizon. They came closer. First of all, we were very scared that they were Italians because it's the enemy, right? But fortunately, they were British. They were British. They cruised around a couple of times, and they... We had, uh, we had ha uh, hoisted the so-called distress flag because some people had died of, of, of typhus. That's why they had up the distress flag. But we, uh, we had no radio. So anyway, these, Greek, these uh, British ships circled around a couple of times and they addressed us with a loudspeaker. They said, who are you? And we said, we are Jewish refugees. And they said, uh, well, I'm sorry, we can't help you. They said, but we'll report your position. And then they took off. They took off within five minutes, they were gone. They go very fast. They were gone. And we continued, uh, we continued with, uh, with breaking up the wood uh, for another day or so. I can't give you an exact day, so, uh, you know. And then eventually, the ship came to a standstill. But at that time, we could see land in the distance. We could see uh, mountains in the distance. The question was, where were we? Eventually, it turned out it was Cyprus. We had reached, actually, Cyprus. Uh, so then we were stopped. There was no more wood. The wood was all gone. The ship, it, I'm not sure whether you've seen the movie Around the World in 80 Days, but that's the way the ship looked. It was just a skeleton left at the end. The decks, there were no decks anymore. It was the steel. There were no masts left. And the, the, the interior was all gone. So... And that's where we were stalled outside uh, Limassol Harbor. Uh, of course, the British knew that we, that, that we were there. They sent out a, a boat. A boat came out with a British flag, and we were glad, let me tell you, we were glad to see the British flag because we knew that we had reached Allied territory. We knew we were saved, as a matter of fact. That was it. Um, so anyway, the British uh, circled our ship. They... Um, and they said, okay, we'll next, next morning we'll send out a tug and we'll tow you into, into port. They, they did that, and the ship was towed into port, into the port of Limassol. And there we stayed uh, about a week or so, I don't know. The captain was immediately arrested, and the whole crew was arrested because they were arrested for bringing illegal immigrants into, into British territory, but I don't know what happened to him anyway. He was arrested, and it was that. Then uh, the British supplied our ship with coal and with a new crew, and uh, we sailed for Palestine <laughs> with a British crew, and there was a British, British, some British uh, soldiers were on board, armed soldiers as, a, as an escort or whatever. Um, the British, you see the difference between the British and the Greeks. The Greeks had supplied us uh, free uh, bread and water. We always got it free. The British, we had to pay. Now everybody, when you leave Germany at that time, everybody was allowed to take out 
five marks and your wedding ring, not anything else, nothing else. Five marks in foreign currency. So everybody had, I think, three dollars or one pound or something like this. I had one pound and three shillings or something like this. This we had to hand over to pay for the food, for the food that the British gave us. You know that 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 uh, that we always never forget that. You know that the Greeks, the poor country like the Greeks, they gave us the food free, but the British, a big uh, nation, you know, they had to, we had to pay. You know. All right now. On the upper picture, if you remember, I told you that on our way to Palestine, we ran out of coal and we had to break up the ship. Now, the upper picture gives you a good idea on how, how it looked this on the, the ship. That's on the Atlantic as, as we are breaking up all the wood on board of the ship. And the second picture? The second picture is a woodcut made by someone in Mauritius, and it, it shows also... It's a picture of the Atlantic, and you see clearly the the overcrowding on on board of the ship. 